A mechanical man can compose type at a rate slightly less than that of a veteran typesetter. However, a tin man doesn't need smoke breaks, doesn't care about monotony, and doesn't mind working through the worst hours of the night. This is why typesetting is an ideal task to assign to mechanical men on a press's graveyard shift, for they can perform it with almost no human supervision, although many other important chores that keep a press running are beyond them. Although human typesetters are in no danger of being entirely replaced by their mechanical counterparts, it is admittedly a great convenience to be able to place a sheaf of typewritten pages in front of a mechanical man when the human pressmen are knocking off for the day. The pages must be typewritten, for mechanical men can't decipher even a child's clean block letters, nor can they set type involving musical notations or mathematical equations. Open up shop in the morning, and the type is composed and justified, and the forms are nearly ready to go. A human compositor then looks over the forms for errors, corrects them, and takes them to the press. In addition to 30 workers, the Zeroville University Press employs four mechanical men leased from Talogen Industries. Only two are working under Harold's supervision tonight. The other two stand in shadows against a back wall as if at attention, the lights in their eyes gone dark. One is setting type, the pinpoint light from its gaze moving slowly from left to right across the page on the desk in front of it, then dropping down to the next line and scanning right to left. A composing stick is in its left hand, and its right, fitted with specially elongated fingers, darts among the irregularly arranged trays of type at its side, placing mirrored letters into the stick. When Harold is paying attention to anything at all, he is watching the other tin man, whose job tonight is to melt down some type and recast it into another font. Its hands move back and forth over an array of devices surrounding a bath of molten metal, glowing gold and red. Tiny lead blocks with inverted letters carved on them in relief are dropped into the bath one at a time, and the letters twist out of shape and disappear amidst bubbles that slowly rise to the surface and explode, each one releasing the whiff of a lost word. The room has a large radio that Harold turns on during his shift, its shape and speaker grill reminiscent of the interior of a cathedral ruin. It is the closest thing to company that he has while he is at work. These low-end models of tin men are not capable of speech, and would not indulge in small talk if they were. He sits in a chair with his arms folded, looking at the inert presses with their huge cylinders, at the tin men going quietly about their labors. The radio plays some instrumental pop music, mutters a good night and sign-off, performs the Zeroville City Anthem, and, without taking a breath first, whispers static. Harold's legs splay and stretch out, and his head drops onto his chest. He snores. A string of drool begins to creep out of the corner of his mouth. The reverse letters melt into hot nothing, one after another. The quiet snickety-snick of slugs dropped in the composing stick. Hello. Harold snaps awake, what, who, what, nearly falling out of the little wooden chair. Hello. Is anyone listening? A voice. Strangely familiar. We're coming from. Radio. Anyone. Is there anybody out there? This is Miranda Taligent. Hello. This is Miranda Taligent. I'm a 21-year-old girl. Woman. I live in the Taligent Tower. I, I know there's no way for you to hear, talk back to me, but... Even if there isn't, I just need to feel like there's someone out there listening.